Can you do le twist? Can you do le click? Can you do le cook? Twist, click, cook. Only from the Dietrich. Visit the Dietrich.ai or any appliance retailer. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Lovely to see you all. Um, so this morning, I'm going to chat about uh, a couple of areas to think about to hopefully make um, getting your kitchen and designing your kitchen a little bit easier. Um, so some of the areas that I'm going to focus on will be, first of all, budget, and in particular, uh, some of the hidden costs that you might not be aware of um, when designing a kitchen. Secondly, I'm going to focus on design and uh, what I'll be covering are some of the most commonly asked questions that I guess that get asked about design. So hopefully that will demystify the whole thing a little bit. And then finally, just to come back to um, well-being and some of the things to think about that aren't really aesthetic, but actually are going to make your kitchen not only look fantastic, but make you feel fantastic as well. So uh, first of all, budget. And I think, you know, the most important thing when planning any kind of home design project, big or small, is to, first of all, figure out your budget. And then secondly, um, to make sure that you set aside a little contingency. So even if it's a very small project, you know, something can go wrong. So just to be prepared for that, because there's nothing worse than starting on a project and suddenly there's not enough money to fix or finish out something. So um, one of the biggest areas that you know, we see can cause issues and can cause uh, budgets to creep up is flooring. Because even if you're just doing a small kitchen area and maybe just replacing the kitchen, you think, you know, I'm just gonna replace the tiles. When you lift up that floor, the stand or the quality of what's underneath might not be very good. So you may have to re-level it, smooth it out. And that actually can be become quite costly. So, you know, just bearing in mind that that will need to be checked. It's, it's really good to get some advice about that. Um, never ever tile on tile. You know, this is something I hear a little bit that tradespeople are suggesting you do or lay a floor on top of another floor. It's just never going to work out. You're going to get problems. And when you're laying a floor, ideally the floor should be laid before your kitchen goes in and it should run underneath all of the units. And this is because, you know, it's going to make it easier for taking appliances out. It also means that you can change things easily. Um, so that's really important. And what that means as well is that you really need to have your flooring picked well in advance of the kitchen going in because things like delays or longer lead times are going to potentially add to the cost and time delays and stuff for your project. <coughs> um, splashbacks are another thing to think about. So there's so many options out there, you know, whether it's tiles, beautiful quartz or stone, um, maybe you want to go for something totally different. And every kind of uh, finish that you choose is going to have to be fitted in a different way. So unless the builder or the fitter knows exactly what you're planning, there may be additional costs depending on what you pick. So things like mosaics or any kind of intricate or specially shaped tiles, those are going to be much more difficult to fit and more costly than standard tiles. Um, similarly, things like quartz or glass you're going to need to um, have all of your sockets and switches cut out before it's installed. And each of those cut cutouts adds to the cost. So again, careful planning is really, really important. Um, and then, you know, there's things like, this is a, um, a project with uh, barn wood and that had to be specially fire treated. So all of these things are really, really important. And unless the bill or the tradesperson knows from the outset, he could turn around and say, look, that's an extra, which could put you over budget. Um, specialist appliances. This is a really important one, like things like the steam oven or hot water tap. All of these things may need to be plumbed in or may need extra power. So unless the builder knows from the outset, that could actually be a really costly thing to come and retro do later down the line. So again, it comes back to really, really good planning and making sure all of these things are picked as early on in the process as possible so that everybody knows what's involved. Um, and then it brings me on to design. And it is overwhelming. I mean, there are so many decisions to be made, especially just in one space like a kitchen, from colour to the countertop to your flooring um, to the appliances. 
So, you know, just to try and help and demystify that, I'm just going to run through a couple of the questions that I would typically get asked. And the first is the style and colour. So this one is really tricky because I think, you know, there's so much inspiration and ideas out there now with social media, with hows, Pinterest, it's easy to get overwhelmed pretty quickly. And, you know, we will meet people who often think, well, I love contemporary, but actually when they start to see contemporary things, that's not at all what they like. So my advice would be to get out and get into the showrooms and start to try and see things as much as you can. Um, and especially where you're planning a kitchen that's going to be part of an open plan space because you're going to want the whole space to flow. So that's the great thing about showrooms. Often they do set up the spaces like that with little living areas or dining areas. So it's going to give you a great sense of how things are going to look in your home. Um, colour, don't be afraid of colour. But I would sort of steer you down the more neutral tones. So some of these dark shades are absolutely lovely. Um, particularly if you have a bright space, you can really work with the darker tones. And if you go dark enough, it almost turns into what I would call a dark neutral. So it just forms a really nice backdrop to the space. Um, uh, neutral is, is great. You know, if you want to go for something lighter, maybe you want to think about mixing in different materials. So like this kitchen here, where we've got timber mixed with white. And, you know, it just creates a lovely sort of timeless look in this space. And then, you know, my advice, because a kitchen is a big investment, is to try and keep it more neutral, like steer away from trends, from very, very strong colours and bring in the colour and the things that you like through accessories. So you can see here we went with bright coloured bar stool and art and stuff. So you can easily change up the look without uh, incurring too much cost. So the next question then that we often get asked is what kind of flooring to go with? And this is a huge, huge dilemma for people. I know when I was doing my own house, this is the one I struggled with the most. Like it honestly took me, I would say, three or four months to choose the tile. And again, this is a really costly thing to put into your house and something that's going to be very, very difficult to change. So my own preference, and this is my own kitchen here, would be tiles. Just purely from a practicality point of view. Um, you know, in a kitchen, you've got water, you've got risk of spills, leaks, all that sort of thing. Uh, so tiles are just not going to give you any heartache. And they're pretty um, durable, especially where you have glazing out to the back. So, you know, traffic coming in and out and also sun damage. You don't have to worry about anything like that. They're also the perfect partner to underfloor heating. So if you're extending, they're a really, really good and practical choice. Um, timber, a lot of people love timber. And, you know, for certain people, this is a really, really good choice. You know, if you don't have young kids, things like that. It will, you know, it is going to need some kind of uh, maintenance and upkeep. You're going to have to mind it, particularly around the sink area. So my advice would be to go for an engineered floor. So that's a floor which is kind of like a composite timber rather than a solid timber because you're going to get less expansion and movement. And it's also an ideal partner for underfloor heating again. So a really, really good choice. And then if budget is an issue and you still love the look of timber, there are some fantastic laminates out there. Um, and there are even boards which are 100% waterproof. So it's really good to kind of shop around, uh, get some good advice. And just if you are thinking of underfloor heating, make sure to discuss that with the supplier to make sure that the floor is compatible. And then the other big decision is countertop. So your choice of countertop is going to depend on three things. Firstly, how durable you need it to be, how prepared you are to mind it and look after it, and then what your budget is. So for, you know, tighter budgets, laminate is a brilliant choice. And laminate has come on hugely in the last few years. There's brilliant uh, products in the market that you'd literally have to touch to figure out that they're not stone. Um, so that's really, really worth thinking about. And do bear in mind as well that the countertop is something you can change later. So, you know, if budget is an issue, that's definitely one area where I'd pull back. Just pop in a laminate countertop and then down the line you can always upgrade. Um, quartz and stone are a great choice as well. Um, these are like man-made composites. Well, the quartz in particular is man-made uh, composite material. Sorry. 
Um, so it will give the, the look of stone, but it's much, much more durable. And, you know, the range now is absolutely huge. You'll get quartz that looks exactly like marble. So it's a brilliant choice. Stone is a great choice. It's going to be less expensive than quartz, but it's going to require a little bit of upkeep. So depending on the color that you go for, you know, you might have to look after it a bit more. Similarly with marble, like that is a beautiful finish, but it is very porous. Um, but the thing about marble is if you like to bake, it's, it's cold to the touch, so it's perfect for making pastry, that kind of thing. You know, so if, you know, cooking is really important, marble is actually a really good choice. So finally then, on to well-being. And, you know, it's easy just to get kind of caught up in the aesthetics and not actually think about, well, how do I want this space to make me feel? So there's a couple of areas just to be really mindful of when you're uh, designing any space in your home. And the first is layout. So just to try and think about that, think about how your kitchen functions, you know, making sure that um, people aren't walking through your working space to get to another area, just to make sure that, you know, being in the space is enjoyable and that it works. Otherwise, no matter what colors or finishes you pick, it's never going to make you feel good. Um, color as well is really important. Uh, you know, you want to just choose a color that's going to enhance the kind of feeling that you want in the space. So for something like a kitchen, you, you sort of want it to be an energizing space. So nice, bright, fresh colors are going to work really, really well. And lighting is really important as well. So what I would say is have different sources of lighting. So you might want to have under cabinet lighting. Perhaps there's something on a, over your island. You want to have ceiling lights and then maybe more little ambient lights around the space. And this is so that you can create different atmosphere throughout the day. So make sure that all of these light sources are on different circuits, and that way then you can turn them on and off as you need. And then if you're not doing a huge job, I would at the very least try and get the overhead lights put on a dimmer switch, and that way then you can just control the lighting levels quite easily. Um, just before I get onto storage, something else if you are looking at an open plan space is noise, just to try and think about, because with open plan spaces, particularly if you've got glazing, you've got tiled floors, they tend to be a little bit echoey. So just think about your furniture, think about things like rugs, um, you know, other things to think about are appliances as well, because dishwashers, even kettles, you know, can be really, really noisy. So something like um, a hot water tap is a brilliant idea because you're just using the water as you need it rather than having the kettle boiling. And then uh, there are quiet versions of most appliances, so it's really worth talking to the different stores about what the options are there. And then storage is critical, uh, particularly for open plan spaces. You know, if there's not enough storage, it's gonna look pretty messy pretty quickly. So try and look for ways to incorporate storage into the space and make sure that you have a nice mix of open and closed so that you can have things on display, but then hide away the bits and pieces that you don't need. And connecting with nature, so whether that's bringing plants into the space or making sure that you have views to the garden, this is really going to enhance your mood. Like there's been loads of studies done where it actually, even a visual connection to nature can be uh, shown to reduce heart rate, to reduce stress levels. So it's a really important thing when designing a space. And then finally, Make sure to bring your own per personality into the space, because this is really important. This is your home, you know, so whatever that might be, don't be afraid to experiment, you know, try different things. But most of all, your home should reflect you. So thank you very much. Would you like to do some questions? Yeah, so things? any questions? <clears throat> Yes, yes, yes. Do you find moving forward extractor hoods are a thing kind of coming to an end as in the ones that are jumping off the wall and you can really see when you go into a kitchen as opposed to, you know, the hoods <coughs> that are built into the hog with the alpha range? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a brilliant point. You know, hoods used to be an absolute feature from things that looked like light fittings to, yeah, as you are saying, like the really kind of dramatic features on the wall. But more and more we're finding that these are things that are being blended into the overall scheme. So whether, 
you know, we've, we've done ones where they're co completely concealed um, or the ones, yes, that you're talking about, which are actually built into the hub, which are very effective. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great. Yeah, no, they're, they're brilliant. And there's also the ones that are flush mounted into the ceiling as well. And those are quite popular. So it's really, yeah, but it, I think it's as well because most kitchens now are part of an open plan space. So you just want them to, to blend a little bit more rather than standing out. Hi there. Hi, you mentioned the contingency. Would you recommend or, or say like a certain percentage of the budget should be contingency? Yeah, I mean, typically we would say 10% of whatever you're spending, but usually it's 10% of the build that you kind of set aside because it's really hard to figure out what else you're going to spend, you know, so it's sort of that build element. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, no, 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 they're not at all. No, there is one here, yeah, isn't there? I can, yes, I can take that actually. Absolutely yeah. perfect. So, the, the boiling hot water tap here, it's, it's a tank, it's a five litre tank, and the water is condensed in the tank at actually 108 degrees. And it's built, it's designed actually to sit underneath your skirting board so it doesn't take any space in the kitchen. And uh, it's constantly boiling, or it's steaming at 108. So, when you turn it on, the water comes out at 100 degrees. And it uses about the same power as a 40 watt motor. <coughs> and then, actually, the cranky ones, they have a little sleep button. So you can send it to sleep every night at, say, midnight, and it sleeps for six hours, and it'll come back on again at six o'clock in the morning. And in addition, as well as having instant 100 degree boiling water, and the noise, uh, what you said, Denise, is, I have it in my own house, unfortunately I have a kettle, and if the news is on or something, it'd be, it'd be, you can't actually hear the TV with the kettle boiling, so it's, it's brilliant from that point of view. But you can actually connect them that you have instant, direct hot water. So as opposed to taking water from your tank upstairs. So if you turn on your normal hot water, it takes the hot water from the tank. And that's hot depending on if your solar panels, the immersion is on, or the heating is on. But if you connect it through this, what happens is the 100 degree water comes in, the cold water comes in together, and within two seconds you get 65 degree water. Mm -hmm. So you just have direct access water. Mm -hmm. And they come in for 999 is actually the starting price of those taps. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you have your regular hot and cold as well, if you want. But is it boiled, it's boiled constantly, so it's not freshly boiled, obviously. No, so it's condensed in the tank. It's finally, it's condensed in the tank at 108, so it's steam. But the tank is specially constructed as well. It doesn't take any uh, to taste or odours or anything like that. I mean, I'm not like, and it's actually the water is filtered going into the tank as well. So the, the water that's in the tank is pure and it's not contaminated. So, you know, I suppose the thing is, if you leave it on, as I said, you can go into sleep mode at night. But if you, you leave it on most of the time, um, maybe if you're going away for a weekend or some a long period like that, mm -hmm. you can actually knock it off. But other than that, you just leave it on all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just there. It's just so handy. <laughs> yeah. And no. as well as that, you don't have steam boiling up underneath the kitchen units, mm -hmm. you know, when you're, when you're boiling. Oh, no, up. it is. Like, I have one myself. They're yeah. fantastic. And yeah. the other great thing is most of them now come with filtered water as well. Yeah. So you have your hot water, your filtered water, and then your normal hot and cold. So it's, yeah, they're, they're brilliant. Oh, the yeah. All in the one tap, yeah, so they'll have different kind of little yeah. fittings or levers, you know, to operate them, but they're brilliant, really brilliant. Yeah, you can, you yeah. can purify your water as well. And, uh, so they go from 999 up to 1800 for a 4 in 1. And I think there's also on the pipeline, there's a 5 in 1, there's carbonated water. Crazy water is on the way as well. So. They always get <laughs> in a kitchen, a pint, small pint wine, is an electric kettle. Every time you knock you need to prior to installation is that you have a minimum of a 1.4 bar pressure because you need that pressure to maintain um, for the water to come out at an adequate flow rate but other than that you change the filter 
uh, I think it's every year, every two years you can buy them, or every 16 months you can buy them online. Well, other than that, it should just run itself. And then it comes with a warranty. Because it's effectively, it's not a tap, it's an appliance. You know, mm -hmm. there's a motor in there, there's, it's, it, it's on a plug top as well. So um, they're relatively maintenance free, but you do need to check your um, mains pressure coming in. It needs to be a minimum of 1.4 bar uh, coming into it. So is it expensive to run? Is it like no, they say about the same as a 40 watt light bulb. So it's just there all the time, you know, for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, um, hot water bottles, uh, you know. Mm. Just, just, uh, oh, they really are, them. yeah, they're brilliant. And they are the, definitely, like, they're less expensive than running yeah. a kettle. So no, it is, it's, it's energy saving. Or even yeah. if you're boiling spots or something like mm. that, you're, you're putting, you can get the boiling water, I suppose, away from the gas or the electric mm. to heat up the yeah. water as well. Mm. So it's just quick and instant. And uh, it's a five litre tank, you know, so... That's a good few cups of tea, so you know, <laughs> before you, you need a refill. But do you notice any difference in the taste of a cup of tea? No. Fresh, fresh no. 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 That's yeah. 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 No. No. Because it is. It's a valid point. Because I have. I think there was one. One of the older ones from years ago, and it used to make sort of cloudy. The water be slightly cloudy. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> the one I have now is. No, because they, they all have little safeties, so you usually have to do something quite fiddly to get the hot water to, you know, with some of them there's like a double push and a twist. Press, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and as soon as you knock it off, yeah. it, it, as soon as you let your hand go, it knocks it off. So if there's a young kid or whatever, yeah. the, and there's a bit of resistance in it as well. Can you do le twist? Can you do le click? Can you do le cook? Twist, click, cook. Only from the Dietrich. Visit thedietrich.ie or any appliance retailer.